What's been happening on your from your perspective in uh, in the DeFi world? What are you seeing in this this bull market that we've got started? Um, is DeFi going to continue to lead us through? We had DeFi summer in 2021. What is the summer of 2024 going to look like? Hey, hey, guys. Um, great to be here today. Um, yeah, so far, um, I think the DeFi theme or topic has only been two things. One is restaking and the other being Ethina. Um, I, I don't think I've seen anything else that's been interesting or pick up any, um, any traction at all besides these two, but, but gladly, um, I think restaking itself is a big enough, um, trend. Um, there has been over $11 billion of TVL lock in Eigenlayer right now. And, uh, Binance has listed a few, um, new projects, um, for restaking. One is, um, EtherFi, which is an LRT project. And the other is, um, my project, Allier. Um, we're kind of helping to build a lot of AV assets that will provide yield for um, all the, um, all the um, I guess, um, e-stake within the Eigenlayer ecosystem. Of course, there, there is um, um, a lot of uncertainty right now. We're working very closely with Eigenlayer to help um, push everything across the line. Um, I think that's very likely that um, there will be a number of AVSs that will go mainnet this month, um, hopefully very soon. And um, during this process, I feel like um, there are still a lot of um, issues in the market where most people don't understand uh, what is eigenlayer really doing or what is um, an avs most people has only been following all the lrt projects which are which are really um kind of um, providing liquid um, stakes or warranty for your stake ease within um, eigenlayer um, i would use the analogy of convex to curve um, when you look at um, all the lrt projects like puffer renzo etherfy um, compared to eigenlayer um, but all these um, lrt projects are not generating any yield themselves um, they are really relying on the yield provided by all the avs's and by avs um, it's really all the projects that are um, that are uh, borrowing the shared sequence uh, sorry the shared security offered by all the ease validators um, enabled by Eigenlayer. So Eigenlayer is just doing one thing, which is to reuse all the ETH validators and all the stake ETH assets to secure new blockchains. Um, and we call all these new blockchains um, using Eigenlayer's um, ETH validators AV assets. So the, this is where the yield are really coming from. Um, and so with all the AVSs going hopefully mainnet this month, we will finally see the real yield for, for the Eigenlayer ecosystem. Um, so far, it's been just um, farming points, farming eigenpoints, um, and hopefully um, users can redeem eigentokens in the future from all these points. But this is not what the project is really about. Um, AVS, um, will like Omni, like, um, like us or like, um, Espresso, all these AVSs will, um, finally show us like what the yield will be and what, uh, Eigen layer, um, ecosystem will look like. Um, and I'll shortly, um, mention the other one, which is Athena. I think everyone is trading in Athena token at the moment. Um, it just, um, ARP trade, um, wrap into a stable, stable coin. So it's really a C5 strategy, a standard quant font, um, uh, business that's, um, kind of repackaged into a DeFi, um, 
token, a, a stable coin for people to trade. Um, I think it's a uh, it's smart. Um, it's not as impressive as some of the early DeFi projects when they first came out. Um, as Isina is really nothing DeFi, um, but definitely with over 60% yield. And actually, I think for most people participating in season one, they all got about 800% yield. Um, I think it's pretty impressive. And uh, as long as the bull market keeps going, um, people will get really good yield from Ethina. Um, well, thank, yeah. Dorothy, thanks for that. There's yeah, a lot there, um, you know, and I think liquid restaking and, you know, liquid staking has been, you know, everyone's launching liquid staking on their L1 and it needs to be a part of the DeFi ecosystem. You know, I think there's a pretty big delineation this time around from last time around, you know, when, you know, some of the DEXs actually just started launching and, you know, has, has some of this stuff, you know, started to be too far out of reach for most retail investors. Like, for example, you know, people would put, you know, you know, they'd get a little bit of Tether, a little bit of USDC and people would apply liquidity, you know, then, you know, I think all, most of retail just got completely wrecked with impermanent loss. And, you know, now, you know, if you, you know, you're trying to get, you know, you need to offer outrageous yield on some of these pools in order for, to get anyone in retail. And then it's, you know, the yield is basically just sold off. And it's like, the, like, I think we figured out that that model really is not going to work this time around, or the projects themselves are left to put the entire LP um, in for themselves. And so are we, and, and the rest of the speakers feel free to hop in, like, are we going to see innovation beyond that in this cycle? Or are we kind of stuck? with that model going into this next cycle as well. I'm hoping that we're starting to get out, but I mean, I, I do think that, you know, what Athena, you know, did introduce, and I think Pendle did this, you know, to an extent as well, is like taking traditional financial structures, like product structures, and putting them into crypto so that retail investors can do less work to have more access to sustainable, you know, tokens. Um, now, granted, to the earlier point made, issue with the USDE is that it only works in the bull market. You can't have negative funding rates using their strategy. But I do think that them and then what Pendle has effectively done, which is coupon stripping, right, this tokenized yield, I mean, that's effectively the same thing, um, that we're going to start to see a more complex financial products that are easier to get access to for retail so that they need to do less, so that you don't need to be a DeFi DJ and do, you know, margin arbitrage across multiple DEXs or um, you know, point mining, which I know that a lot of people have been doing on some of the protocols um, to, you know, get not only a good return, but also get something that's protected, you know, get a protected return. Um, because as we all know, you know, these bull runs only last for a limited time. <laughs> They're not forever. Um, and so conditions will inevitably change. Um, yeah, absolutely. DeFi God, Justice, want to bring some other folks into the conversation here. What are your guys' thoughts on state of DeFi here in 2024 as we start to move into Q2? Can I jump in? Go for it. Yeah, so um, where, where, where can I start? <laughs> the I think... I think right now, obviously, we're getting into a certain level of sophistication. Um, for me, look, I, I'm, I, obviously, this is this is great, and it all works until it doesn't. Okay, and uh, and uh, we have a very fast cycle. Uh, I think this point was mentioned before. Uh, so this stuff obviously needs to be tested uh, on in 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 the way down, right? Uh, and that includes obviously as you get sophisticated. Or as you in, introduce new products, you're also introducing new risk. And I think there is less discussion around the risk related to these type of products. Uh, um, and I think, to be frank with you, I think the weakness of this of the current cycle is going to come from uh, one of these uh, protocols getting hacked or something like that and completely removing, uh, completely threatening or shaking up the trust. 
that we right now have into these products. So obviously the yields are attractive. Uh, uh, obviously a lot of entrepreneurs understood that last time around, the reason why we found we had huge protocols uh, that attracted a lot of people was because the yield, uh, 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 the yield story, the yield narrative attracts a lot of people. But what we forget to mention, like always, is that this stuff comes with a huge risk, and I and I really, uh, 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 I really would like to see project talking. Obviously, they mention the risk in the white paper, but you need to read it, etc. But 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 you need. I mean, this uh, as part of acquiring new users, bringing new users to the platform, they need also to disclose the risks and to talk about the risks and to educate around the risks. That's all I have real to quick, say. Real quick, Zillion, do you think that retail has learned its lesson a little bit on that yield chasing? Oh, of with course Zillion? not. <laughs> of course not. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely nothing. I mean, look, I mean, if, 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 if a regulator as mighty as the SEC, okay, is, is calling for this project and tell them get to compliance, etc. And you still have attempts that are completely centralized with the with the DeFi wrap wrapper, okay, with a marketing that looks like decentralized finance, and they still push in for to get users, etc. If if the SEC does not scare these people, I don't know what scares them. To be frank with you, okay, I don't know what scares them. So I don't think anyone learned anything. And I think obviously the risks of this bull run of this cycle will come from different areas. And I think in this type of applications where they're basically zero, I, the more I hear what's coming into the market and the repurposing that we have of value, etc., uh, uh, that, that is coming to, to this market, like now there is a huge, I think this is a huge point of leverage, although it's not leverage per se, it's not direct leverage per se, but I think this is a huge point of risk and uh, projects need to educate around it, educate themselves, first of all. And backtest stuff and, and try to provide retail a bulletproof product. Otherwise, they will suffer consequences. And this time around, uh, it's going to be more aggressive than last time, I think. All right. The market is the market is the market. Things will happen. I like it. Uh, Justice, go ahead. Um, uh, I meet everybody like. Uh, um, okay, Justice. Hey, Jim, Jim, um, Jim, Joe. Okay, sorry, I didn't really, really join on time. What is the topic basically, so I can know how to contribute? <laughs> we're talking, we're talking DeFi here. Uh, so just kind of follow along. Okay. Hey, Robbie, maybe you can. You had your hand up. Maybe you can speak. I think you had a thought, and then Justice. Yeah, yeah I, I just there. read. Uh, just, uh, Justice, I just read your uh, bio. DeFi, uh, okay. what is it? Uh, DeFi Chad, love it. You fit the yeah. description. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> Jim, so, well, what I feel DeFi helping into the Web3 space, I mean, personally, my view on decentralized finance is an individual having access and full control of their money or their funds, you know, far from the sex, you know, centralized exchanges, you trade them on the centralized wallets. And I think um, Zillion was talking about... <clears throat> the SEC controlling and coming into this space and having regulations. You know, I just signed a SAFT today and in signing it, there was a whole lot of things to be aware of that this is not, not a security. It is not under the SEE, the set control of the United States. You know, when there are um, disclaimers like this, you know, this is like a cloud to make sure the, uh, the SEC doesn't come in. You know, the only way they can come in is when, when you say when you say your token is a security, then they want to control it. But when you state it while signing any document that, hey, there are risk to investing in this. You might lose your money. You might, I mean, gambling is not a crime anywhere. It's your discretion you get. So, they tell you you might lose all your money and you might make a whole lot of money. So they will let you to know that this is not safe. This is not a security. Secondly, <clears throat> talking about centralized finance and what we should look into or what we are expecting, it's no longer a news. We've seen gaming, we've seen AI, and we've seen um, real-world assets. I mean, with NVIDIA trying to 
you know, back most of these projects. And you know that, yes, gaming should be like the next thing in the DeFi space. Looking to gaming projects, AI projects. There was this token, it's an AI token. Um, I think it's Deal. It launched a while ago, as well as um, NMT. I mean, I bought NMT. Um, that was since um, over two months now, or a month plus. I don't really keep notes. You know, because of, you know, what the teams are doing, they are docks, they are building, they even have an office, and the technology is even is already in use, as well as deal. So, whenever I see, uh, uh, I don't want to show my bags here, but I have a lot and lot of um, real-world asset tokens I'm looking into. For. I dropped a, a trade on one recently, even before joining this space, and there is some I just invested a few days ago, and some I'm still trying to look into. Yeah, so... Looking forward to decentralized um, finance, you know, this is, a, this is an uh, attention-seeking speed. So, you need to know what is the market talking about so that you can position and don't get left out. Of course, um, I think the last cycle, you, you see um, projects building wallets, building bots, and they are like, did they talk? They, they are like the news. But now, the trend in the DeFi space is... AI, gaming, and real-world assets tokens. There are many of them, and they have done numbers, and as well as BRC tokens as well. Um, these are tokens that have way, way done numbers. I think the last cycle, or last year, we looked more into NFTs, but this year, it's more of them um, DeFi tokens. And I mean, meme coins are doing crazy numbers as well. Yeah, justice, for sure. As well. Yeah, th those are different narratives, right? Yeah. Like, let's be clear. Like DeFi is its own narrative within that, and then RWA AI and everything else. Uh, but good, good thoughts. And then yeah. uh, go, go ahead, Robbie, and everyone. Make sure you give Robbie a follow here, and then at Umoja Protocol, Robbie. I don't know if you want to bring the actual handle up. There, there are sponsors bringing us together today. These spaces are always amazing, and uh, the conversations are awesome. So give them a follow. Go ahead, Robbie. No, no, no. I appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted um, a few comments on. Um, like increasing DeFi risk with complexity of the projects being introduced to the space, but then also the comments on the SEC. Um, so I don't want, I mean, one, Zillian, I absolutely agree. I think that was, you know, though I do love what Athena is doing, I think that that's one of the issues with their their positioning, right, to, produce, to position something as a synthetic dollar when your principle is actually not safe, right, because to the earlier point made, um, like it, it relies on a bull market existing. Um, if it doesn't, then it does go the opposite way. Um, those risks need to be made more clear. Um, though I do think from an architectural perspective, when it comes to like a DeFi wrapper over sex, they have chosen an interesting way to implement something that otherwise can't really be performed on decentralized exchanges. Um, and I think that to your point, like your risk should be very candidly stated in your, in your technical documentation and that should really kind of be a requirement of any white paper as well um, to the comments about the SEC and you know whether they set a good pace for one a reference point as you know an international regulator on capital markets in the United States but then just to you know how to avoid their ire and I say this as an American I think that the trend will go away from the SEC's decisions dictating market swings internationally. Um, and that and the main reason is, is because the U.S. is not a thought leader in blockchain or digital asset regulation by any means. Um, places like Singapore, London, Dubai, um, far, 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 far better. Um, and you're seeing a lot of the best projects actually domicile into those areas. Um, and actually very recently, I believe the U.K. Uh, announced um, you know, an, uh, an ETF variant of, for ETH that they had plans. So you're going to see other financial markets just regionally start to do things that they want to do rather than taking the lead by the SEC. And I think that's going to damage their their their, their soft power in, in terms of the industry. Um, you know, secondly, I mean, I think, I mean, obviously this is an offshore game when it comes to the legal structures necessary to enable these projects to exist and also be protected um, as well as hopefully protecting end users in terms of auditing and testing. Um, and as you all probably know, I mean, those are the Singapore foundations, the VVIs, um, the VASPs, you know, across the Caribbean for Caymans. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Um, and I, I think that's some of the bigger risks that these projects, you know, you know, come into and something that Umoja ourselves 
has had to think very critically about. Um, but yeah, those are just my thoughts. Really good thoughts. DeFi God, and then Eyes, Uniswap Bill and After. DeFi God, have anything to add? If not, Uniswap Bill and go ahead. Um, all right. There you all go. All right. All right. Uh, yeah. Uh, I just want to add something to what Zillion was saying, talking about, about DeFi and the security, you know. Because um, as we're having some kind of uh, this bull run coming up, a lot of projects coming up with kind of uh, malicious things, bad doubts, and just like I tell my community all the time, you don't jump in everything that you see on, on the space because this time around is very dangerous, you know, and, and uh, just like we had during the bull run in 2021, now it's coming up again and and you know, um, um, there gonna be kind of um, scams and all these malicious things that are happening because all these projects right now, they are not all of them are not real, you know. So, but um, on the other hand, the uh, introducing DeFi, the staking, and all that is um, a kind of um, an opportunity for the new days to raise capital in order to jump in into the um, crypto space, you know. So. I think uh, balancing the two of them, I think it's just 50-50 just for us to do a, a kind of research, you know, and before jumping into um, because a lot of people are coming in right now, a lot of newbies coming in to jump into crypto and uh, most especially the, uh, they're jumping into DeFi, which they don't know any knowledge about it, so we need to create awareness about this new uh, things that are coming out, uh, create awareness about DeFi, create awareness about the, the good and the bad of it, you know, so that's what I want to contribute into this. Thank you very much. Sure, thanks. Uh, Uniswap villain, you got anything to add to the state of DeFi uh, yeah, sure. going into the, the summer and then uh, we can continue it? Yeah, sure. Uh, I liked how you, uh, you started me out with eyes there. That's fun. Um, yeah, I, I think, I forget who it was, maybe... Uh, Zillion, but one of the prior speakers was talking, actually, no, it was Robbie, was talking about how he thinks that uh, projects will stop focusing so much on what the SEC thinks, and, you know, I, I really don't think that's the case. For what it's worth, I think the way crypto works is still very US-centric. Like, there's a whole world out there, but I also do VC investing, a lot of it, and almost every SAF that I get in front of me talks about how they have fear of the SEC and the regulations. You have projects that literally will not talk about a token um, for fear of the SEC. And I think like a lot of people who are making projects in crypto are not, you know, are against expectations or kind of risk averse. And a lot of them are based in the US also, and they just don't want to take that risk. You know, I, I, I think an important subject matter for DeFi and also for talking about like the US is Uniswap. So Uniswap most recently allowed revenue sharing, right? And that was a big thing that just wasn't allowed in crypto for a really long time because everyone just feel, feared the SEC um, and their thoughts on revenue sharing. And I've seen a lot of projects now kind of move towards a revenue share model, uh, which I've always thought was the superior way to design tokenomics. If you think about it, just stripping away all the complicated technical things, if you're buying a stake in a crypto company, you wanna have a share of their earnings, right? And how would you do that? You would do that through a revenue share model, right? And you can't do that with stocks, like you can through dividends, but as we all know, dividends don't really work that way and a lot of companies don't offer them. So I was happy to see Uniswap actually kind of take that risk and move forward. And the fact that they did, tells me that I think the SEC and just the United States government might be a little more open to a lot of this stuff not being considered a security um, than it appears on the outside. And then I'm just going to keep going through a bunch of topics that you guys talked about. So also in terms of raising, I'm not sure how you guys how much you guys are all aware of, but Morpheus uh, just raised recently. And if people are concerned about how to raise capital and avoid like the SEC and regulation and stuff, the way they did it is incredibly clever. They basically set up a staking contract 
and you gave them STF, which for people who don't know is just a yield generating asset attached to Ethereum. It's just staked F. And that earning on the staked F actually went directly to the Morpheus AI project, right? And then as an exchange for giving them your yield, you received a token of Morpheus AI um, wow. when they go live. That's, go this is the, the, the brightest way I have <laughs> seen in a while. This is really good. Some people yeah. think outside of the box. Yeah. It, it's genius, right? Because everyone wins. So Morpheus wins because they get the yield. The people contributing win because they're only risking the opportunity cost of deciding, hey, am I going to make more than this yield on this ad, right? Uh, I probably will because I think Morpheus is a really good project backed by great people. It's an AI meta, right? So it's just a really clever way of raising capital. And it's also a clever way of raising capital in the sense that you avoid regulation, right? You're not actually technically having a token sale. There was another one that I'm sure a lot of people aren't aware of called Glow that was so afraid of U.S. regulation. Um, and they're doing something revolved around energy credits that they basically threw up an Etherscan contract and said, hey, guys, if you want to contribute to this, you have to go onto the contract and through the contract, like call the right function and buy the token, right? And their lawyers told them that that didn't constitute a token sale because you were basically going into open source code um, and deciding to buy the token. And it's like 10 or 15 X or something. It's like a really smart team that otherwise would have VC backing and have gone this traditional route. Could you elaborate really quick on the the rev share for Uniswap? So is Uni yeah, Uniswap sure. have they overlaid a fee on top of those LPs? Yeah. So the way they're going to be doing it is they have a front end fee on their UI, right? Um, and basically, if you're using their UI, uh, they take a front end fee from you, and then they're taking that fee and they're using the revenue share out to their stakers. That's how I understand it, right? So like if you look at something like GMX, GMX was like the first project that ever had any sort of revenue share, right? And since then, a lot of projects have modeled in the same way. And for Uniswap to do it was just kind of a, a pretty large step. And that's why you see other projects like in the DeFi. That's why all the DeFi projects pumped because everyone was like, oh, if Uniswap does it, well, Sushi Swap's a beta to Uniswap. So, you know, it, it will do it as well, right? So that's kind of how you've seen it because Uniswap is like the industry leader. Incredible. I love that. Yeah, reading now that uh, if the initiative, if approved, which it probably, like, was it already approved? This might be older. No, this was just a couple, a month ago. Yeah. Um, yeah that's what I said. It could pay out between 62 million to 156 million uh, to uni owners and annual dividends. Yeah, the coin pumps so much because, like, if you think about it, right? Why, why would you own Uniswap otherwise? Who really cares? I, I, governance is a meme. People say it, but it's true. Like, no one really cares about voting. Like, no one actually votes on protocols. People want to say this stuff is decentralized, but you have, like, big VCs who own large stakes in some of these projects that already control the vote. Really, the best way to do it is you design a token, and that token has a utility. And that utility, if you're building a utility-based project, has to be something that causes the token value to go up and makes the token actually needed, which a lot of projects just simply don't do. They create a project and they think, wow, this is really cool, unique tech. Well, that's awesome. And then throw like an LP staking pool, which is like the history of DeFi, right? You used to have DeFi where you had all these projects that come out in the yield farm. They're like, okay, you know, you jump into this suicide pool of Ethereum and your native token and you get more yield than someone else who's coming in and just staking USDC. And that's great and all, but the game theory there only goes so far because those people who are staking USDC and USDT, they're just going to dump on you. Like you look at something like Synapse, right? Synapse is a phenomenal project. They have like an awesome bridge. It's like one of the only bridges I use. Their tokenomics make zero sense, right? All they had was just yield farming for years. And you have people getting an 8%, 9% yield staking USDC because they need money to support their bridge. And they just sell the Synapse token. Why would you ever buy the Synapse token, right? And that's why they're trying to like build a blockchain now. But like the fact that DeFi started, it was just purely speculative. Everyone was like, yeah, let's just get yield and like Ponzi this stuff. But none of the tokenomics ever made sense. And unfortunately, you see a lot of projects nowadays that come across your desk and they still don't make sense. And you talk to the founders, they're like, oh yeah, you know, we're just doing it. We're going to have some sort of farm so we can distribute the token over three years. Like, well, that's cool. But like, why would I buy your token? What's the point of it? Right? I, I love that so suicide farm. I like, I'm going to use that going forward from here on out. But it also, people yeah. are people are petrified, right? Because it's like, hey, I, if I'm going to pay out dividends, is that a promise of you know upside? Right. And is this yeah. a security? So, like you're saying, of people course. have been um, frozen. So, yeah, go go ahead, Robbie. I know you were hand up. Yeah, 
yeah. No, no. So, so I think I think my my original point might be misinterpreted in terms of projects won't care. I think that other financial markets won't care. Um, the, the SEC. I mean, the, you know, as you all know, they have an open investigation on Ether being a security, in which they already had said publicly that it wasn't prior. I think, I believe last year, um, you know, more so under the governance of the uh, commodities regulator in the U.S. It's not a matter of whether projects, you know, will be fearful of, you know, the SEC. I think that that will always exist, be just because of how the U.S. is positioned right now. But if we are to think of, you know. Uh, the, the growth of the total market cap of, you know, the, you know, crypto as a whole, you know, as a function of institutional adoption and inflows, like what we've recently seen with the BTC ETF, then that is not just a function of U.S. financial markets introducing those products. It's, it's an aggregate function of all international markets introducing those products. And if you continue to see, you know, like, you know, going back to the example, you know, investigations into the Ethereum Foundation about one of the most used and built upon blockchain, you know, native tokens being a security. The the power in those decisions, the reputation in those decisions becomes watered down, um, particularly in the context that you know the United States still lacks really any formal digital asset framework like you're seeing in these different regions. Now, I think that still projects will you know form offshore. Um, but another thing that I've come to realize, and I only realized this recently, not even during my time of consensus, but now as a protocol founder, that um, the trading volumes that move the market, at least on the retail side, are also not U.S. centric. Um, this is coming from the CIS region, right? Previous Soviet Union. This is coming from Southeast Asia. Um, you know, um, also you know India, if you consider India not necessarily part of Southeast Asia. Um, uh, and, you know, from a retail perspective, that's why you see this whole meme coin season that we're having right now, um, you know, rather than, you know, uh, projects trying to be sensitive to the SEC in the context of potential growth in the future. Um, and so, you know, those two things, I think, are going to just make that regulatory regime less relevant, not completely relevant in terms of, you know, projects still being careful but I think less relevant in the, in the, in the, in the long term. I, I think those are good thoughts. And, you know, it like talking, you know, the, I just got off another meme coin space and I've been doing nothing but talking to a lot of the meme coins over the last month. And, you know, part of the, their explanation of why meme coins are, are moving so quickly is that, you know, the, the promise of the utility token of the, pa of the past is, is like a, a team that doesn't deliver, right. Or a team that, you know, just basically gives up, right? Because they can't move forward. And so what they, it seems like what the market would rather like is a team that's like, I'm just going to get out of the way. I'm going to launch this thing. It's going to all be about this one meme. And to people, it's kind of wild to think that that would be a, a, a bet that they would want to take over utility, but it does make sense. 99% of startups fail, right? So it, it then the, if that's what a utility is, is a part of, then it's like, man, I got to make a really rough choice on where to place this bet. If 99% of these things fail versus, hey, I'm just going to go, oh, have fun in a meme coin community and sure, one of them goes. Ice, right, go ahead. Ice, right, you there? Go for it. Oh, He's sorry. I thought, said, I thought you said Ice. Yeah. <laughs> ice. Yeah. I mean, I, for those of you who don't know me, I mean, I've been one of the biggest people in the meme coin space for like the last three years. I'm, I'm one of the biggest like snipers uh, on Ethereum, right? So I would love to talk about memes. I actually do uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at, at 3 p.m. for a little plug on, on Mario's channel where I kind of teach people how memes work and how to avoid rugs and kind of just really data dump my brain um, on spaces. I think with meme coins, right, the biggest thing is having delved into DeFi, NFTs, I, I've done it all, right? It's kind of like you said, a lot of utility projects aren't worth the value that they say they are. And if you really just think about it, you can, you know, rationalize it. It's crazy that they have the valuations they do. And they're also all backed by VCs and have tokenomic models that are incredibly unfavorable for people who are trying to speculate. And those people who are trying to speculate, a lot of times they don't even understand what the tech is. So why would they bother 
doing DeFi and, and getting involved in like these real projects, right? When they can just have fun and embrace memes. I think like crypto, for what it's worth, if you strip it all away, it's a lot of gambling. Even if you think about like these real projects, it's still gambling. So why would you do anything else uh, rather than participate in memes and have like this incredible high upside, high risk, right? Uh, but be able to embrace like the attention economy, which is what crypto effectively is. And I think with meme coins, the biggest thing you see with meme coins is that they die as soon as they start thinking about utility. Right when a meme coin says like, oh, you know, I think we're going to start building a decentralized exchange or, or build a lending protocol. Everyone's just like, well, like, who cares? Like, it's bullshit. Like, we're not buying your coin because of that. We're buying you because you're a dog with a hat, right? So I think that's what makes meme coins so interesting is that it brings people together um, and it focuses on like what's hot right now. They move very quickly. And I think... You have a big shift in the meme coin space, you know, about six months ago or so you had all these NFT guys who were sitting on their pedestals about how NFTs are great and these DeFi guys doing the same thing. Now I have angel investors and VCs and stuff. They're launching meme coins. You have real like projects, right? You have like blockchains, like layer one blockchains coming out and like supporting meme coins because they know it brings money to their chain and they know no one gives a shit about what they're building and their chain is garbage. Like a lot of these chains, right? Like you look at like Manta, right? Or you look at, um, what's the other one that just launched uh, on, on Puff? Like those chains are, are Mantle. Those chains are not good. No one wants to play on those chains or do anything on those chains. The only reason they're going to those chains is to buy meme coins because meme coins go up in value, right? And I think the fact that these projects and like blockchains are starting to realize that you need to get people in the door with meme coins really sets the stage for like the start of kind of a meme coin revolution, right? That's that's basically my my spiel. <laughs> yeah, can I can I jump Good in spiel. on here? Sure. Yeah. So I I really thought about this and I've been uh, trying to identify like uh, trends etc. And I really thought about this. Um, and I think that the uh, the meme coins you know meme coins are able to build one utility which is graveyards for other to tokens. Okay. Because because the essence of a meme coin community is basically that community in that speculation atmosphere right so the only way they can use that into something good is to put it towards reviving a community sense of dead projects right so so i think that meme coins obviously capture the essence of what we have right now in the environment which is the community value the network value right that community value that that bunch of people that want to speculate together uh, on one thing. So, uh, and yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say is I see a lot of parallels between meme coins and penny stocks, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah 100%. I think. Yeah, no, it's definitely well, somewhat yeah. similar for sure, just on a larger scale. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and that's the thing is I feel like these early iterations as to what the market reacts to, though I do agree that, you know, this market is definitely more socially and retail driven, even up to the point of influencing institutional de decisions in terms of how investments are made. I would still say that there are there are so many parallels with what happens in traditional financial markets and what's happening in crypto right now. I mean, the same kind of narrative driven, you know, uh, pump and dumps, you know, you, you, you see, you know, in, 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 in formal traditional markets. Um, and, and, and also, I mean, you see similar market manipulation as well. Um, you know, uh, I was actually had an interesting conversation. I don't know if y'all know this, but like, you know, people you know sometimes ask like, why doesn't the price of gold go up if it's a scarce resource that's continually you know drained of its supply? Um, and it's because you have you know larger institutions that introduce you know paper gold into the market, and that's why you have stable prices around you know resource constrained commodities. And I think you see that like on steroids in crypto. You see that around. You know, you know the prices of meme coins. Um, sometimes, you know, other tokens that might be a little bit more involved, um, and it's a lot easier to facilitate because you know there's, you know, a whole supply chain of KOL to retail trader to trading on oh, yeah. the centralized exchange to make that whole process happen in like a day <laughs> instead of like a month. Um, you know, which is, is you could argue that like Ethereum and Bitcoin, right? Like the manipulation with that, right? A lot of times you see the price move five six percent ten percent and then you see news drop like a week later right i think like every market is really manipulated but the cool thing about memes is everything is manipulated right um but with memes you can get in them
early and you can be the person that like helps impact the coin and actually do something whereas you don't have that power uh with some of this other stuff and like penny stocks are, are fine as like an example right but i think the the big difference between a penny stock and a meme is is the community right um and being able to get like that exposure and another really cool thing you see with memes now is like we're all sitting on a spaces on crypto twitter right and a lot of memes are derived from crypto twitter or people who use twitter but there's tons of times where during the day there's coins that come out and people are like where did this come from right and what that tells you is there's other sources of information where people are sitting and they're thinking about coins and buying coins that they think are cool that aren't necessarily here right we often think like everything is here because you know a big name here talks about it it's going to be a big coin but it's cool to see some of these coins that are clearly derived from other sources just exploding justice what do you got Okay, um, okay, can you guys hear me? Sure can. Yeah, so, um, my, my take personally on meme coin, because whether I'll take it or not, yeah, um, meme coin will definitely win this cycle. These are my reasons. Now, you're not expecting anything from the projects, of course, it's a meme. You know, reason why some utility projects tend to go to zero is you make lots and lots of promises and they end up on the, um, on the delivering, you know, they were over promise and on the deliver, you know, you expect these projects to bring out this utility. And like you said, this, like you already said, this space is an attention seeking space. The moment they, they don't see you being active, I don't know if most of all you're active during the N NFT era. Once the founder is not saying GM, the founder is not replying um, the community, the founder is not active, people start selling and, you know, leaving the community. It's like that everywhere um, in the crypto space. It's the attention-seeking space. Now, when it comes to meme coin, as long as the, the, the project is able to, you know, make memes every morning, make memes in the next 10 minutes, in the next one hour, they're making memes. People are like, oh, they have a, uh, an active community. And now, meme coin tends to uh, move to the way where uh, there are certain people that have made name in the meme coin space, made lots of money, made lots of people money. And the moment they talk about a particular meme coin, there is most certainly that the meme coin is going to, you know, go a particular way, it's going to pump, it's going to pump. And because they are not expecting anything, there's no utility there, they're not expecting so much from the project. You just buy and, you know, go, go with the vibe. It's just vibe. They come on the open spaces, they talk random stuff, they mention the, the meme coin, the token at interval, and you know say other things they catch up it's just fun and you know the major one of the reasons why we are in this space aside of course we say we are here for the tech we are here for the money and um, when it comes to utility projects you know you, you get on pre-sales there, there are locks there are vesting seasons yeah you are expecting token unlocks at a certain certain time but here in main coin there's no token unlock there's no particular person that is holding 10% or 20%, you can see it on chain that, hey, this person is holding a particular amount, this wallet is holding a particular amount, and you, you know if the, the wallet sells or not. You're not expecting, so when you see a token move this way, people just buy in, you know, 50,000, 100,000, and they know once it goes to X, they, are, they can remove all their money, you know, you don't have to, you, you don't have to, you know, wait for a project to tell you, hey, you have to lock 10% or 20%, it's all fun, and... The easiest way to you know to 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 you know earn so much in 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 the space right now is new coin. Yes, I mean we've seen not yeah, just this, real quick. I mean I, I think it's good thoughts. It's like but you know like if I'm sitting down with a money manager at Goldman Sachs, and I know that's not our direct audience to buy meme coins, but you know maybe someone that's a little bit close on that side. And, and I said, hey, you know as long as the founder wakes up and makes memes every day, this thing's going to move, right? Like I don't know if that's the fundamentals. That yes, I think yeah. The utility is 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 the is is the is how active the the Twitter handle is. How funny the meme can be. Well, That's the utility. It, it could be the utility. As the price goes up, man, that's the utility. <laughs> yeah, and, and it could be no, the founder you, getting out of the way, right? Or the founder burning the the pre -sale. Yes, no, it could be other no, the, things. The moment you see, okay, the LP is burnt. The 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 community is not having. No, the found the deployer is not having. Um, ten percent or twenty percent. Once they see, okay, most of the tokens are in in the hands of the community. 
yes the token goes up and you know once the price goes up that's that's the utility and the community being active too yes so it's that simple cool Awesome. Well, I know we're weaving, we're weaving in and out of uh, meme coins and, and DeFi. We've got about 10 minutes left here. And uh, we got Robbie up on stage from uh, Amuja Protocol. And, you know, the, these spaces are amazing. And, you know, people bringing us together, we're having a good time. So Robbie, you know, if you want to give us like the quick, like two minute pitch uh, on what you guys are working on, and maybe these speakers have, you know, got some quality people up here that can ask some some good questions about what you guys are working on. And, and uh, let's hear it, man. Yeah, 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 and, and hopefully we, we hold up to the fire of all the good critiques that have being shared. Um, so yeah, I mean, very quickly, guys. Um, Robbie Greenfield, uh, founder of Umoja. A quick background: I've been in crypto since 2011. Um, I was started by career Goldman Sachs, and I was formerly the head of social impact at Consensus. So effectively, my entire adult life, I've either been developing DApps as an engineer or or deploying them. Um, for Omoja, um, you know, the, the, the marketing label is a smart money protocol, but uh, what that means is it's just a protocol that helps customize financial products on chain. Um, and so a perfect example was, you know, for those who are familiar with Athena, Athena is just a synthetic dollar that's, you know, based off of underlying trading. Um, and we want to help create those type of financial products, you know, via tokens, much more easily using, you know, a library of um, automated strategies, whether it's sex-based or DeFi-based, um, to, you know, hopefully uh, make it easier for retail to, um, you know, manage uh, their money. Um, I mean, as you all probably know, the vast majority of opportunities are shielded from retail. You, you, retail usually gets sold losses to in crypto and TradFi and virtually every market that retail investors exist in, as we all know. Um, and it's near impossible to give everyone on the planet the financial literacy necessary to avoid those pitfalls. Um, and so the premise is, is, you know, can we create products that protect against risk by themselves, um, optimize yield in, in, in responsible ways, uh, rather than requiring people to, you know, read blogs on Medium or tweets as to what's popping off. Um, and so I already launched on Arbitrum about 5.4 million in notional transaction volume over the last six weeks or so. And our investors are uh, Coinbase, Orange Dow, Blockchain Founders Fund, 500 Global, and, and Norquin, amongst others. But certainly open to, to any questions that anyone has or talk about anything, to be honest with you. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah, great investor base. Um, I, I'd actually be interested in what was your a little bit of your pitch um, to, to some of those investors that came in when they said, you know, like what, like, what are you guys, like, you know, when you look at your competition going into this, you know, what, like, what are you guys doing differently? Like, what was your answer to the competition question? Yeah. Um, I mean, just becoming the most composable and automated DeFi protocol that isn't tied to a single asset, um, is usually what I say. I mean, so when you look at, you know, things like uh, Pendle or Urine Finance, right? Those are very composable, but they can also be very complex or they can be tied to a certain vault strategy so they can be limited. But then you, when you look at, you know, projects like Athena, for example, it's like, okay, well, that's one single hard-coded synthetic dollar um, and it's tied to those risks. Um, and so, you know, the argument that we make is, is that because we know that DeFi and TradFi are going to inevitably converge, there are going to be many different products, um, and the best ones with the best yield, with the least risk, are always going to win. That's one thing that we have continuously seen, especially in crypto. Um, and so why not create something that is flexible enough to create those products, earn fees from them doing well, um, but then also be able to create new ones when you know their strategies deprecate for whichever reason, which is also pretty much inevitable with any, any token. Um, yields always go down eventually. Um, and so, um, that's usually what I'll tell them. And so, any speakers got questions for Robbie here? Yeah, composability is a big deal. I think this cycle around, uh, being also, uh, asset agnostic is also a huge deal. Um, I mean, if you've been to, uh, Eater De Denver, you'll see that the, it's a big theme, uh, this time around. Uh, so yeah, definitely something relevant. Robbie, maybe you could talk a little bit about the actual, like, you know, when you talked about retail 
coming in and making it simple for them and, you know, democratizing the opportunity. Maybe you could talk a little bit about like, is this going to live, you know, as like a mobile app first web app where it's like, I'm just logging in deposit, you know, spread my yield out. Like you guys take it for me. It's like four taps and suddenly I'm making 6% or 8% or whatever it is. I'm getting access to that. Like what's the actual like user flow for someone that's a retail investor. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there's really two ways to use it. Um, you can either use, these individual strategies directly. So, so, for example, let's say you wanted to hedge your, you know, um, Bitcoin risk, right? For whatever reason, you don't think the Bitcoin halving is going to go well, uh, and you just want to make sure that you, um, you know, save your money uh, from 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 you know losing it. Um, now, obviously, a pro trader would just you know buy a you know, put option or trade a few put options, and they'd be good to go. But most retail traders do not know how to trade derivatives, um, especially with leverage and especially without getting liquidated. It's very, very, very difficult. Um, and so that's one of the strategies that we have um, live right now. Um, you can hedge, you know, 20x leverage, liquidation uh, uh, protection is built in, um, and you can just set it and forget it. Um, and of course, if the price goes up, it loses value just like anything else. So. You know, the stated risks are pretty pretty obvious, but it's something that's a lot more easy to interface with than going on to Deribit uh, or going to the Binance, which is literally a wall of numbers. Um, and preventing things like liquidation can be very difficult because that's a 24-7, you know, margin maintenance uh, job. Um, for those who want to be even more passive, um, it's just, um, you know, purchasing a token that's based off of these primitives. Um, you know, a perfect example that I give um, is if you're, and we've actually talked to a few of the large staking protocols about this, like if you have staked ETH into uh, Lido and you get ST ETH, but you want to protect against a permanent loss, um, if, if you wanted to do that now, you would have to take several steps in DeFi to actually accomplish that. Um, but we can create a hedged ST ETH token that automatically does it for you. Right, it would just be a synthetic put option embedded with STETH in a single contract, and that then is a new token. Um, and so those are things that for people who want to have multiple strategies at play just by holding assets rather than um, vesting them or using some copy trader platform, they'll be able to do those things. And it's the hope that you're going to have better retail investor outcomes because of being able to passively manage their assets in that way. Um, rather than, you know, read uh, a, a God-fearing amount of documentation to become as financially literate as possible with everything that's going on. Yeah, I mean, most people still, a lot of people don't even know how a credit card works, let alone yeah, 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 <laughs> what you're yeah. talking about here. And there's a reason that most people's wealth, like at least in America, is held in, you know, insurance products and 401ks and retirement accounts is because they can't touch it, right? It's passive. Yeah. Um, and so yeah. to, to yeah. give the average person access to some of these things, like they don't know what a liquid, even being liquidated means, right? Like they're like, yeah. what does this mean? Are you just dumping like water on me? Um, so yeah. I, think, <laughs> I think it's, it's incredible. The and public I, shaming. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I want that. Like, uh, so it's, it's, it's incredible. And it's like, I know we get into the weeds on some of these things, but I, I, that's why I try to help sometimes from a, like, Hey, like how is someone to come in here and like tap five buttons and know that they're going to get a better yield. And then from there, trust what's going on and feel comfortable because, you know, as much as we talk about web three being in, like incredibly trustless, right? Like we went through this whole thing with, a, you know, especially if you're in the industry, it's like when you have a, a web wallet, it's kind of like, Oh, I've got to connect to this website. And while I do so, I also need to connect my entire bank account to this website. That seems kind of gnarly. Yeah. And so that's why you do see things yeah. like Uniswap, <laughs> like working because it's like, oh, I know that website. I know it's going to work, right? And I and I feel comfortable. And so it's like, you know, interested to think about how you guys are thinking about building that trust. And then or eyes, do you got eyes slash you just swap villain? Do you have a question <laughs> for Robbie? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Um, so is your guys protocol peer to peer or you guys have a counterparty? How are you actually like handling what's going on in the back end? Yeah, no, those are both great questions. I can uh, answer the counterparty uh, question first and then um, the, just how we deal with risk more generally and just transparency. So it's dependent on the strategy. Um, you do have certain, like, for example, our synthetic options um, that are two of the primitives that are on beta right now. Um, so, so 
for a very quick TLDR. Synthetic options is a trading strategy that seeks to replicate an option more affordably and more flexibly than any traditional option that exists for BTC and ETH. Basically, it means you can go long or short with leverage, still be safe from liquidation, and understand what the hell is going on. Um, those strategies are sex-based strategies. Those are centralized exchange-based strategies and the perpetual futures markets of those exchanges. And use a similar uh, structure as what Athena has done with USDE and that you use off-exchange service providers uh, so that collateral is never on-exchange. You know, uh, the only thing that can withdraw from those custodians is the protocol smart contract uh, and then the positions are facilitated on sexes. Um, and you, then you'll have others that are DeFi based, like, you know, doing loan arbitrage across credit protocols or margin arbitrage. Um, and so, you know, the counterparties uh, can change uh, depending on the strategy that you need and, you know, the requirements of that particular strategy to be implemented, right? So for synthetic options, you need high liquidity unless you have to use centralized exchanges, at least for now. I think that will deprecate the DEXs eventually. Uh, or ones that are DeFi native where it's like you couldn't do this with sexes if you, you wanted to. Um, and then, of course, there's different risks associated with those different strategies, and that's something that we try to uh, put in as much in our documentation and tutorial videos as possible so that people are aware. But then also, you know, try to strip out as many of those risks or make people aware as to how to counteract them as possible in the UX of the application itself, right? Um, I mean, one thing that's always irritated me with liquidations, for example, is, is why would you put a trader in a position to be liquidated in the first place? Right. There, there are ways that exchanges can avoid that. Right. Um, they could just unravel the entire position altogether before they hit the, you know, the, the, the maintenance margin. Right. So they at least save some of their collateral. And we, we call this internally like financial UX. Like there are th ways that you can make risks disappear by not allowing users to get close to them. Um, you know, and that may stop their trading or whatever they're trying to accomplish, but it will save them in the near term. Um, and then, I guess, going into transparency, uh, you know, we, we try to make our documentation as, as like painfully explicit as possible. Um, translating into multiple languages, which we just now supported Mandarin, um, and then, of course, doing a lot of video content, which, interestingly enough, protocols more generally do not do enough of. Um, yeah, video is great. Expectation. Yeah, you know, like like you should, we should be seeing a lot more videos on how to do all of these things constantly, but we really don't. Um, you know, you either go to a conference or you read a blog, and that's how you learn how to do that thing. Um, that and obviously just taking into consideration the compliance. Um, so having offshore accounts in regions in which you have certain flow between the foundation and the protocol that doesn't violate any you know virtual asset service provider laws, at least in the context of the, the Caribbean. Um, you know, and, and whatever, whatever else you need to do to avoid getting a subpoena, right? Um, so those, 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 that's kind of how we go about that. Robbie, as we round out here, um, how, what about the, uh, I saw we pinned the, the tweet here with the airdrop announcement, and then how is the token going to interface with the, the community and the protocol, and what, what are you guys thinking there? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, for anyone who uses um, the synthetic options, again, you need to go to X long or short on BTC or ETH, especially with this upcoming halving, might be helpful. Um, just using the protocol makes you uh, airdrop eligible, so I mean, we do appreciate our community, try to give as much tokens to them as possible. In terms of utility, I agree that governance is a meme. We do use vTokenomics just so participants can govern, but I always expect governance participation to be low, to be quite honest. Um, the two that I do find helpful uh, are an insurance pool to defend against black swan events and uh, discounts on protocol fees for all token holders. So obviously both of them are inflation sinks, one built to um, avoid uh, under collateralization if in case you know prices of uh, ETH or BTC or anything related to the positions of these strategies greatly loses value very quickly because we've seen that negatively uh, affect Maker around a year or so ago with Black Thursday. And then the last one is just, you know, um, uh, getting people to hold the token within their wallets so that they can get up to 75% discount on using any of the strategies directly or creating new assets from those strategies uh, as well. Amazing. Well, Robbie, congrats on uh, getting everything to where it's at. Speakers, appreciate you being up here. And uh, yeah, good luck with Umoja. I mean, I can tell 
you are very versed in the space, been around the block. Uh, you know, you've got, uh, you're looking a couple of steps ahead in the market and what's going on. So, um, you know, really quality stuff here, man. I appreciate you being here. Everyone in the audience, give these guys a follow, check them out. Got the pin tweet up there. Give them a follow and look at their pin tweet. And uh, you guys rock. This is a great space. Looking forward to uh, hopefully chatting with you all again here soon. But thank you all very much for being here today. Thanks, guys.